Good afternoon and welcome to this seminar, I may say special, very special seminar in the summer. My name is Bert Hoffman. Uh, I'm the chair of the Department of Epidemiology and we are very pleased to host Dr. Karl Lauterbach and a whole delegation from his ministry. Dr. Lauterbach is one of us. He uh, did his doctorate here in the Harvard School of Public Health, DSC 1995. In 1998, he became the director of the Health Economics and Clinical Epidemiology Institute in the uh, University of Cologne in North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany, and also a professor of clinical epidemiology. In 2008, Dr. Lauterbach became an adjunct professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management here in the Harvard Chan School. And since 2005, he is a member of the German Parliament, the Bundestag. Um, and since, as you know, December 2021, Dr. Lauterbach is the Minister of Health of the Federal Republic of Germany. Karl, it is really a great pleasure, not only, but also certainly an honor to have you. And I. Uh, I really look forward and I invite you to speak about the G G7 Pact for Pandemic Readiness Enhancing Collaborative Surveillance and Rapid Response. Dr. Karl Lauterbach. Uh, students, uh, colleagues, first of all, uh, I have started here roughly 30 years ago and I still remember how inspired I was at that time by the atmosphere, by the work that was going, that was going on here at that time. And uh, whenever I come back, I remember that inspiration. I feel it again. So for me, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here today. And it is in particular an honor for me because there is also some of my former teachers here in the room. I cannot name all, but I, for example, see Joe Newhouse here, from whom I've benefited so much. I see Michael Reich here, who is here. Uh, Bert is here. Uh, I see a couple of uh, former colleagues. I see Aaron here, so wonderful. And so it's a mixture of people I used to learn from, I used to work with, and also students here. So it's a really inspiring atmosphere. It's a pleasure for me to be back. And I think the importance of the school, as a matter of fact, is increasing in these days because public health threats internationally are becoming ever more important. Therefore, to deliver an evidence-based education to address public health challenges of the 21st century, uh, such as, for example, pandemic control, dealing with the challenge of climate control, uh, dealing with chronic diseases. These challenges are ever more important, and we need the teaching, we do need the science, and I interacted with a couple of scientists this morning already, and I, could, I should actually say internationally, what is done in the School of Public Health here is regarded as extremely valuable in many countries. And I can speak from the German perspective, we follow very closely the, the research that is done here. We have used it in the pandemic. We will continue to use it. And it is work that is established and is recognized well beyond the borders of the US and definitely acknowledged and used in Germany. Well, why do we use, why do we need superbly trained experts and students? Because First of all, we need the research, but also we need the research for policymakers to draw from this research. But if we want to have good policy, the policy can never be better than the research that has informed the policy. So therefore, expert knowledge is becoming ever more important because we need an increasingly expert and knowledge-based policymaking. I will come back to this in a moment. The pandemic, as bad as it is, and it is far from over, has made us more keenly aware how important public health research is. And therefore, there is a moment of opportunity for us 
to, let's say, change institutions in a way that there is a more immediate, a more direct response to new research in policymaking that comes from public health research institutions such as the schools. Therefore, what I will focus on in my talk is, let's say, the G7 initiative, an uh, initiative which will look at better pandemic preparedness. But before I come to that, let me point out that it is not clear that in the future we will be better prepared for new pandemics than we have been in 2020 when we were ill-prepared. I currently think that uh, as things stand now, most likely we will not be better prepared than we were in 2020. Why is that so? Uh, first of all, in order to be better prepared, we need better institutions that are responsible for pandemic preparedness. And while we are uh, at the moment where we have to discuss such institutions, we are already distracted by new challenges to public health. Let me start with Putin's horrific barbaric attack on the Ukraine. This is taking away a lot of attention, as a matter of fact. I'm in touch and in exchange views with the Ukrainian Minister of Health, Viktor Lyashko, very regularly. And we try to, let's say in Germany, we try to help to meet the public health challenges that come along with this war. As a matter of fact, in this war, and I visited the Ukraine a couple of weeks ago, there is an incredible number of people, you, you, we only hear about the soldiers dying and the civilians dying, but there is an incredible number of people who become severely wounded and who, for example, lose legs or arms or have major head injuries. From a public health perspective, this war is a nightmare. Typically, soldiers, for example, nowadays are better protected trunk-wise by military vests, but legs and arms and also the head are not so well protected. And also in these new wars, in comparison to older wars, bullets are not, let's say, the prime cause of injury, but blast injury are far more commonplace. So when there is blast injuries, Typically, legs are injured in a way that very often amputation is the only solution. And also major head trauma is going on. So what we in Germany do, we first of all fly out severely injured soldiers and civilians and treat them in centers of excellence for, let's say, burn injuries and polytrauma. But many of these, let's say, patients coming to Germany end up having amputations or having head amputations already. So therefore, the number two on the list of what we provide in terms of public health support is we provide prosthetic devices because this is more or less the only thing that you can, that you can do. Therefore, we help the Ukraine to fit prosthetic devices that are then manufactured in Germany and we basically ship them into the Ukraine that they can be used. But it's a huge public health catastrophe about very few people talk. As a matter of fact, if you have one soldier die, you typically have five to 10 major injuries, very often civilians, very often children. And it is very little talk about this catastrophe. Also, if you look at the war in the Ukraine, and let me stress, it's an inexcusable war by Putin himself, by him exclusively. He's exclusively responsible. And I hope that this bloody war will come to an end. But when the war comes to an end, the Ukrainian healthcare system will most likely be completely destroyed. What we currently witness there, and I, vi I visited hospitals on the ground, we see the complete destruction of a healthcare system in a ver very short period of time. So this is a challenge for all of Europe, as a matter of fact. It's a challenge for all of us, because what the Ukraine is doing, Ukraine is also defending the very democracy from which we all benefit. So we owe the Ukraine later help to rebuild this healthcare system. But to lose an entire healthcare system in the middle of Europe is a public health con uh, catastrophe of first order, and for a long period of time, 
will draw attention from public health researchers, attention which is needed also for better preparation for pandemic pro uh, control in the future. But this is not the only competing healthcare crisis which, which takes away attention from pandemic control. Number two, equally important, is climate change. And it is becoming ever more clear that climate change is also a public health catastrophe, not only directly by leading uh, towards, let's say, deaths from heat waves, dehydration, diseases that immediately following, follow heat waves, or drought, for example, undernutrition, malnutrition, lack of water, lack of sanitation, all of these are, let's say, immediate consequences. But there is also the uh, not so immediate consequences in the long run that, for example, climate change will make pandemics to become ever more likely. Because what comes from climate change is basically that animals uh, compete for their habitat so they, in, they interact in ways that they have not interacted in the past, and they also come closer, wildlife animals come closer to human beings. And if you only look at, let's say, the potential number of viruses that are currently seen in bats and other, let's say, animals that are potentially a threat, for human beings because they could live in humans but currently have not jumped into humans. Estimates are between 3,000 and 10,000 viruses are posing such a risk. So it's only a matter of time until climate change has made more and more of these outbreaks become big enough that they become pandemics. And this is where, let's say, pandemic preparedness comes in, and I'll come to this in a moment. But as I should say that, let's say, therefore, before I come to pandemic readiness, Germany, we are currently the G7 head country, we are, we are the, G, the leading country in the G7, uh, let's say, circles. Germany, uh, in the healthcare system, has a focus on three topics. Number one is pandemic preparedness, come to this in a moment. Number two is AMR, antimicrobial resistance. And number three is climate change, because we regard these three topics as the leading topics, as the leading challenges to public health internationally. And I could, three about, uh, I could talk about all three of them, but in the limited time available, I would like to focus on pandemic preparedness, which is also, let's say, the most important topic from these three to topics uh, from my perspective. First of all, uh, if you look at the many institutions that are currently already responsible for pandemic readiness or pandemic preparedness, if you list them up, you wonder, because it is quite a long, impressive list, and they were all already in place in 2020, if you look at the list, you wonder how could the virus ever stand a chance to become so prevalent? Wasn't this list intimidating the virus enough to step back and say, I will, not, I will never have a chance to get through here? Ultimately, many of these institutions were either underfunded, had no clear structure, existed only in acronyms, did not really have a clear-cut role, and were not working in concert. And what is the situation now? Is there a big change? In my opinion, it is roughly speaking exactly the way it was two years ago, two and a half years ago. So we need, from my perspective, to have a new approach. And one of these approaches that is currently developed is an approach that uh, we as a G7 leadership country, together with scientists from all over the world, including, for example, Jeremy Farrar from UK, uh, including, for example, uh, Tedros from WHO, Mike Ryan, including also in one of these meetings, uh, Mark Lipsic, researcher from all, from all over the world. We developed a system where the general idea is that what is needed is an international system of excellence in centers of excellence, in hubs of excellence that are distributed around all of the world. 
there is two competing visions as to what is the best strategy for better pandemic readiness in the future. One vision is that we need to have hard money and basically an army of scientists that are waiting for the next pandemic to happen and then they immediately respond and basically um, kill the fire. So that is an idea which, for example, um, is defended by Bill Gates, but not only by him, by many other people that we need a kind of a fire brigade, a fire brigade for pandemic readiness, which is basically doing drills, waiting for the next possible pandemic to happen, then immediately coming in, possibly wearing white helmets, having connections to the local, let's say, uh, governments, and then help to extinguish the fire. I think that this system will never work. First of all, if you look at the 3,000 people who come up with that type of a skill, my opinion is we don't have them. We literally don't have them. Secondly, in case of, let's say, an outbreak at the brink of becoming a pandemic, it would be very unlikely that they would be prepared to enter a country or would even be permitted to enter a country. And it would also be unclear what they could possibly do on the ground. So therefore, I think this is a technocratic idea, which if you, let's say, imagine how it would work in practice. And this is by now me being a politician uh, rather than a scientist, uh, or a politician and a scientist. That's the perspective which I take. How would it work, for example, if we had the, Germ if we had the pandemic starting in Germany? What would be the benefit of such a, an army potentially prepared or willing to help us. I could not immediately see it. I could not immediately see it. The alternative model is the model, model that Jeremy Farrar, a couple of other people and me, which we developed over the last couple of months, which is that you have to begin with five centers of excellence for pandemic preparedness in the north and in the south. And these centers educate young people in the skills of pandemic readiness. What are these skills? Basics in virology, basics in AMR, basics, for example, in epidemiology, basics in genotyping, basics in modeling, basics in, let's say, pandemic control, basics in, the, let's say, how WHO works and so forth, basics in, let's say, um, working with databases, which you can use in order to see the genetic distance between a new pathogen and what is already known. Basics in developing a diagnostic text for, tests from, let's say, uh, a genetic make, uh, makeup. Basics uh, in, let's say, um, pandemic response in terms of what gear is needed, uh, what collaboration is needed. So you have, uh, let's say, the basics of science, which is very much let's say, grounded in epidemiology, but goes beyond the epidemiology because it includes, let's say, let's say, zoonotic knowledge, virology, uh, let's say, um, modeling sciences. Uh, so, it, so basically the skills that are typically needed for pandemic control. And if this is taught in hubs in the north and in the south, you will end up with a workforce that goes back in the country, into the countries where these people educated there come from, and they, let's say, not only have this knowledge, but they also export this knowledge into their countries. So it is, it is, an, it is an increasing network of people, and if this network is then connected in a way that they are regarded as not only alumni, but they work together on all outbreaks which are there. It's a, the drill then is basically to communicate about the many outbreaks that there is per year. On average, we have about 200 outbreaks per year, 30 with new pathogens, about half of which pathogens that are zoonotic pathogens. So if, if, so if you have this network, working together on outbreak discussion or control, then this is a kind of drill, which is, let's say, not a dry drill, but a drill on the outbreaks, which there is, and a, a group of people working together connected. That could then be connected also with 
let's say, industry hub partnerships could be connected with education for community workers, for community health workers, for example, that for this network you also, let's say, have uh, people in these countries which are, let's say, almost like the sensors of networks, for example, teachers that recognize that some students are missing without knowing why, teachers that recognize that students have diseases which are unusual, that are not easy to be explained, nurses that understand, let's say, that this could be a disease that is harmful and so forth. So if you have, let's say, local uh, work, health workers, we have a network of well-educated people, and you have these hubs, and in the hubs, then the work can also be done which is needed if there is a local outbreak, for example, if these are facilities in the hubs where you could use, to give an example, nanopore devices or where you could do modeling where you have a group of people that is, let's say, able to quickly de develop diagnostic tests together with, with uh, industry. So this is basically the vision that some people, for better or worse, are developing currently and that Germany uh, within the G7 leadership is pushing forward. So the G7 has agreed on this vision, but it is not quite clear if it is moving forward. One thing which is a good news is that uh, there is money for, this, uh, for such a vision available because, uh, let's say, the G7 countries and a couple of additional countries, they invest money in such what I would call a pact for pandemic preparedness. And the World Bank, for this Pact for Pandemic Preparedness, has created a financial intermediate fund with about $1.5 billion per year so far. So let's say a resource is currently built up for this type of work. But the way this financial intermediate fund works is currently under debate. This is one of the reasons why I entertained this visit, why I was, let's say, in... in in Washington, meeting with the bank, also with uh, IMF, and uh, we, let's say, uh, negotiate with the bank and the IMF and others to build up a system that works into that direction. Success is possible, but not certain, because there is also competing, uh, let's say, agendas, competing ideas, and I think competing ideas is always a good idea. But uh, nevertheless, I hope that our idea will ultimately prevail. Let me point out that such, uh, in such an initiative is not an initiative which is in competition with what, is, what WHO is doing. And let me point out it is also not a G7 enterprise. It is already endorsed by G20, and it is meant to be all-inclusive so G7 initiated that, or is going to initiate that, but it is already well beyond that limit, and countries are contributing that are G20 members or not even G20 members. So this is meant to be all-inclusive, and it is also meant to work together with WHO very closely. We were even supporting the idea that the office for this financial intermediate fund should be in Geneva at the headquarter of WHO. That was decided not to be the case two days ago, so it will be in New York instead. But never mind, never mind. I mean, work together with WHO is what is planned here, and WHO is an integral part of the board that develops these, uh, let's say, initiatives. Let me point out what is the... Comp now, so therefore, the good news is the Financial Intermediate Fund is coming. The Pact for Pandemic Readiness is moving forward. But where is now a final risk that all of this could still not work the way it is intended to work? How could, it, uh, how could we end up in a couple of years no better than now? Well, one major risk is that the World Bank is now, in, uh, let's say, considering what they call a broad approach. And a broad approach is, on the board, you have, let's say, recipient countries and you have donor countries. And as the World Bank typically does, there is a one-to-one -one relationship. So therefore, let's say, a country requests money for pandemic preparedness. The money is then given, and the bank then monitors how well this is going. 
Well, this is exactly the opposite of this regional hub system which we are advocating. Because the, likely, the likelihood is, if let's say individual countries request money, then there is many countries which ultimately will have projects, but it will not end up in a system. And most importantly, it will not be investment into brains. It will not be investment into proper education. It will not be investment in a network. It will not be investment in what I believe is more important here, which is, let's say, soft power. Because soft power is what is actually running pandemic preparedness. Hard power, technology, you can quickly access by collaboration with the industry. So therefore, my uh, fear is that, let's say, if, if this becomes a standard World Bank pro pro problem, like World Bank is typically doing, um, bilateralism, it will not work. That is my fear. So therefore, we are working in, in favor of the system which I have just um, described. And this will, let's say, be decided in the next yeah, couple of months. And we will then see where it is going. If the Pact for Pandemic Readiness and the Financial Intermedi Intermediate Fund fail in a couple of years from now, this will be a double failure. First of all, we will not have used the opportunity. We will not have used the crisis. And secondly, most likely, the program will also not survive. This is what, uh, I, what I think is, let's say, what we have to keep in mind here. But the pandemic preparedness is necessary. And it is astonishing uh, how little was invested in the past. If you, for example, now hear 1.5 billion per year, I mean, this sounds like a lot of money. But if you look about at it, it is, let's say, little much than one in a thousand on what we spend on defense. And if you look at the expenses that uh, follow on an outbreak where we were unable to prevent it, it to become a pandemic, I mean, the costs of a lost opportunity to prevent a pandemic are such mind-boggling that the investment of 1.5 billion or 2 billion is a very, very, very minor investment. And I, sh I think Joe and me will agree upon this. It is, in essence, it is completely unreasonable that we haven't had this investment in the past, as a matter of fact. So therefore, these are important decisions that uh, have to be made. Let me finally come up to let's say, your role here and your work. And again, for me, it's a privilege to see this spirit, idealism, intelligence here in the room. Um, I have, in the last 20 years, become increasingly convinced that we will, in the future, only be able to manage the many challenges if scientific results enter policy decision-making and politics more quickly than has, that has been the case in the past. Challenges are speeding up, so we have to speed up in infusing science into, let's say, our daily decision making. And therefore, I want to stop in encouraging all of you, work as policy close as possible, and even consider becoming policy advisors, policy makers, or even politicians, which is not, clearly not a lifestyle decision, I can assure you, but nevertheless, it is something that is, I mean, for, for, for many of you, it is very uh, important or become activists. We need a much better grounding of science in our daily policy making. Otherwise, there will be no way that we will master the challenges ahead, the most important challenge ahead of us which goes beyond everything that we have ever seen so far, which is the climate change. Thank you for the attention.